Our next session um, will be presented by Dr. Kathleen Kerr and Dr. Gary Francis. Um, Dr. Kerr is in, is in, um, I'm so sorry. There, there she is. Dr. Kerr is a pediatric endocrine fellow um, at the uh, University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. Um, Dr. Kerr did her medical training at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia. And she also completed her pediatric residency at the same institution. Um, she's currently a third year fellow. Her project is in molecular analysis of thyroid nodules in Hispanic patients. Um, she was a 2021 Pistola Outstanding Fellow Abstract Awardee. Um, Congratulations. So all, all fellows, um, um, we do give awards to uh, the outstanding fellow after the presentation. Um, she is mentored by an excellent and internationally renowned pediatric endocrinologist. Dr. Gary Francis graduated with honors from the University of Florida College of Medicine, Gainesville completed pediatric residency at Yale New Haven Hospital and University of Florida College of Medicine, completed his pediatric endocrine fellowship at the University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma Children's Memorial Hospital and NIH, NICHD. Dr. Francis had a very distinguished career in the U.S. Army where he received multiple service awards, including a bronze star. And a proficiency designator. He retired as Colonel in the Cold War after 20 years of service. Thank you so much. After retirement, he joined the faculty as professor of pediatrics and chief of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology and Metabolism at Virginia Commonwealth University a Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. He is currently clinical professor, Department of Pediatrics, UT Health Science Center at San Antonio. Dr. Francis has over 100 publications, and most of these are on his research work in thyroid cancer genetics. He was the chair of the task force commissioned by the American Thyroid Association to develop the inaugural management guidelines for children with thyroid nodules and pediatric thyroid cancer. And today we, are, we have the pleasure of hearing them present on the use of Affirma genetic testing for um, FNAs to predict thyroid cancer. Dr. Karen, Dr. Francis, thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, for that lovely introduction, and thank you um, also to the organizing committee for the invitation to be here, and for all of you to sit through some thyroid talks. I must say that uh, Stephen Wagespack and Andy Bauer were also co-chairs of the Build On Committee, so it isn't all mine. Oops, that didn't move anything. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. So for uh, I do have some common stock in my retirement account. I do not personally manage that, but for transparency, it's listed here. I will not be discussing any non-FDA approved treatments, but Dr. Kerr will be. I would refer you to the current guidelines, which were published in 2015. Stephen and I are now working on new guidelines probably in another year. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Our objectives today are to for you to be able to describe the prevalence and risk of malignancy in thyroid nodules in children, describe the benefits and limitations of ultrasound and fine needle aspiration, and describe situations in which your profiles may be uh, helpful to prevalence, risk of malignancy, and current evaluation of thyroid nodules. And then Katie's going to talk about molecular profiles, our evolution care, and um, a little bit of differences between pediatric and adult guidelines. So how common are thyroid nodules in children? Well, we have good data, background data uh, from the 
Chernobyl nuclear accident and from Fukushima nuclear accident were evaluated by ultrasound. You know, the background prevalence is somewhere between 0.2 and 5%, 0.2% in the youngest children, 5% in our teenagers, but that's less than adults where it's about 19 to 35%. However, if you do ultrasounds, be aware that cystic lesions occur in about 50, 50 to 57% of children, so you'll very commonly find sonographic abnormalities. And importantly, there are groups where thyroid nodules are much more common. Interestingly, if we look back at discrete events like nuclear weapons uh, use, the patients who went on to develop thyroid nodules and thyroid cancers were less than 10 at the time. And we see, as seen in the lower part of this slide, that there was a dose-dependent effect with um, absorbed radiation exposure uh, at higher levels for malignant nodules compared to benign. How does that translate into our current world? Well, for our cancer survivors who've had radiation exposure, ultrasound detects nodules in almost 60%. Children's Oncology Group and the American Thyroid Association guidelines say that palpation is an adequate screening tool, but the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the European societies say that ultrasound is recommended. There is a dichotomy in opinion. In theory, if you do ultrasound, you'll detect about 15 additional thyroid cancer detection may allow you to treat them with less aggressive therapy. We also see thyroid nodules in a large proportion of our children with autoimmune thyroid disease, both Hashimoto thyroiditis and Graves disease. About a third or so will develop thyroid nodules over about a five-year window of time. And children with goiter at greater risk for thyroid nodules. In this Korean study, almost two-thirds of children with goiter had thyroid nodules. Iodine deficiency. In Poland, where iodine supplementation was discontinued, the incidence of thyroid nodules went up by 50%. And you should note that in the United States, about 6% of our children are currently iodine deficient and at risk. Importantly, we know that for decades now, about 25 to 26% of thyroid nodules in children turn out to be cancer. So it is an important duty to evaluate. So here's your patient. Unilateral enlargement of the thyroid, consistent with the thyroid nodule, and your main question is whether or not this is cancer. So how do you begin? Where you're going to start, is there any history of radiation exposure? Is there any family history? So if there is a family history of thyroid cancer, the risk that this is cancer goes up about fourfold. And there is a recommendation in the guideline that ultrasound should be performed in childhood for children who's, who have a first-degree relative or family member with differentiated thyroid cancer. So for us, that's usually siblings, and it is important to get that ultrasound done. So uh, let's talk about radiation a little bit. When you have a discrete event, like the Bravo test in 1954, we saw nodules occurring almost 10 years after that exposure, and thyroid cancer is about 15 years after that exposure. So the thyroid cancers are a little bit later, and as we've already said, uh, dose dependent. The Bravo test was a long uh, we did a lot of nuclear testing in the U.S. and we contaminated pretty much everything to the east of California. So we all have a lot of radiation exposure. And again, shown uh, following the Chernobyl nuclear accident, the clear dose dependence between the absorbed dose and the risk of thyroid cancer. How does all that translate to our current world? Well, a single chest CT in a girl less than 10 increases her risk of differentiated thyroid cancer about 14-fold. So we need to be uh, judicious in our employment of radiographic studies. What about non-radiation-induced thyroid cancers? Well, there are genetic predisposition cancer syndromes that are associated with both benign and malignant thyroid tumors, including familial adenomatoid polyposis, carny complex, Dicer-1, P10, Cowden syndrome, Werner syndrome, and others. So we should screen for them. Familial adenomatoid polyposis. As you know, the risk of colon cancer is about 100%, but the risk of thyroid cancer is about 2%. And the recommendation is that annual thyroid exam should be done beginning at about 10 to 12 years of age. And that particular cancer syndrome is associated with a unique cribriform molecular variant of capillary thyroid cancer. So if you see that on pathology, other members of the family should be screened for this entity. 
Gardner syndrome, a variant of familial adenomatoid polyposis associated with colonic polyps, osteomas, soft tissue tumors, and thyroid cancer as the most common of the endocrine tumors. Carney complex, autosomal dominant, cardiac, endocrine, cutaneous, neural myxomas, pigmented lesions that somewhat resemble Newton Albright syndrome. Dyster 1 syndrome, now seen in about 10% of our differentiated thyroid cancers in children associated with multinodular goiter and differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Cadden syndrome, another common entity that we see in pediatric thyroid cancer associated with macrocephaly and about 94% of the children who have this goiter and mucocutaneous lesions. Differentiated thyroid cancer has been reported by as early as age seven. So thyroid disease is very common in the P10 hamartoma Cowden syndrome with a 75% prevalence and frequently it's the first organ system to be involved. Dicer 1, 75% of women and 17% of men will develop multinodular goiter by age 40. And that mutation confer confers a 60-fold increased risk for differentiated thyroid cancer. So if we have early onset familial or male multinodular goiter, that should certainly prompt the thyroid ultrasound and we want to screen for a family history of other Dicer 1 associated tumors. For the P10 hamartoma syndrome, unfortunately that's a consideration in a number of our children. Young patients with a history of thyroid disease, including lymphocytic thyroiditis, who go on to have nodular hyperplasia, follicular or papillary thyroid carcinoma, we should consider the P10 hamartoma syndrome and screen for that. Having said all that, all of those syndromes together only account for about 5% of differentiated thyroid cancer in children. The other 95% non-syndromic associated with multiple susceptibility genes identified in the lower part of the slide and all different chromosomal loci identified just above that. So having gone through your history, looking for radiation exposure, family history, you're gonna do a serum TSH. And as you would expect, the lower the TSH, the lower the probability that this is malignant, primarily because of the presence of hyperfunctioning nodules, but the risk is not zero. And remember that all those hyperfunctioning nodules are gonna be removed. And then you're gonna do a thyroid ultrasound and you're well familiar with the features that are associated with malignancy. Hypoechoic lesions, irregular margins, subcapsular location, increased blood flow, calcifications, abnormal lymph nodes, TSH, and growth of the lesion, particularly in patients on levothyroxine. So all of those features need to be taken into account. Now in the adult world, they've summarized that into a numerical score, TIRADS, and the recommendation is that for TIRADS three and below, those patients can be followed. And for four and above, those patients should undergo FNA and probably surgery. There are a few studies that have looked at how these numerical scoring systems perform in pediatrics. And what you can see from both of those published series is that about 20% of thyroid cancers in children would be missed if we followed the adult TIRADS guidelines. So you need to keep that in mind if your radiologist gives you a TIRAD score and a probability of malignancy. And then this uh, multi-study uh, review, uh, looking at all the four ultrasound-based scoring systems, uh, half of the pediatric cancers would not need an indication for FNA if you followed the guidelines. So we need to look at these numerical scoring systems with a grain of salt. Go back to your uh, thyroid ultrasound. This would be a typical benign lesion, well circumscribed, with a nice halo around it. These would be typical for papillary thyroid carcinoma, the upper left with increased blood flow, the upper right with microcalcifications, the lower left with a subcapsular location, and the lower right with uh, irregular bores and calcification as well. And so you're gonna do your FNA for suspicious lesions like the ones that you just saw. And we know that that performs quite well in pediatrics. Our overall accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity are quite robust. And what we currently recommend in the guidelines is that FNA should be performed on all nodules greater than a centimeter in children, unless they're purely stick, and between uh, a half and one centimeter if there are suspicious findings on ultrasound. And the reason for that is that small lesions often look benign, but can be follicular variant, papillary thyroid carcinoma, or others. And when you do that FNA, you're going to get 
one of six answers based on the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology, non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory, benign, atypia of uncertain significance, follicular neoplasm or suspicious for neoplasm, suspicious for malignancy and malignant. And the ones that we had the most trouble with are the Bethesda three and four, those atypical or uh, suspicious for follicular neoplasm lesions. Early studies, as shown here, suggested that the probability of malignancy was higher in pediatric series than in adult series. So for the atypy of uncertain significance, 28% versus 5 to 15%, so almost twofold higher. This is an important paper that was published in the latter half of 2021 reviewed a large number of pediatric nodules that will be quoted many times. And what they concluded at the end was that the risk of malignancy was the same for all of those Bethesda categories of children. And their suggestion from that was that we're operating on too many children. And there's a big however at the end of that. If you could only read the article and not the following two letters to the editor, you're going to miss the fact that reanalysis of the data by an independent team on the left and the same authors on the right concluded that the risk of malignancy was about two to two and a half fold higher in children than it is in adults for those atypical lesions in the Bethesda three and four categories. So that's important to keep in mind when you get a back from your uh, cytopathologist with the risk of malignancy. So if you have a highly suspicious ultrasound in children, we're going to remove those despite benign cytology because about 5% of those turn out to be malignant. Even in the small lesions, we know that lymph node metastasis are more common in children, those with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, about 40% of lymph node involvement, so they may not be as indolent as they are in adults. So that's why we tend to interrogate and potentially remove small our lesions. And over time, that's led to this evolution of care where we're now following benign nodules expectantly by ultrasound, if that and the FNA are appeared benign. And we're now doing genetic analysis for those atypical and suspicious lesions in the Bethesda 3 and 4 categories. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kerr for some molecular biology. Hello. Um, so driver mutations have become a really, really important um, factor in our understanding of thyroid carcinoma, both in adults and children. And commonly implicated is, is the MAPK pathway, so the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. And um, here I've just highlighted an orange and purple set on an important driver mutations in pediatric PTC. Uh, here being the receptor tyrosine kinase proto-oncogenes RET, TREK, and ALK. And uh, further down in the pathway, the RAS, BRAF, NEC, BRK, and AKT molecules. And these are uh, commonly mutated in, in thyroid carcinoma, especially in pediatrics. Because of that, um, there have been drugs developed to target several different um, of these receptor tyrosine kinases. And here I've highlighted in green lymphatinib. Um, so these are a class of drugs called multikinase inhibitors. And um, these uh, affect uh, tyrosine kinases in multiple cell types. So here's shown a thyroid cancer cell on the left and a vascular endothelial cell on the right. And you can see how um, lenvatinib inhibits the RET FGFR in the thyroid cancer cell and the VEGFR in the EG, uh, FGFR in the endothelial cell. And because there are so many targets, um, these drugs are associated with multiple side effects. So here's a case that I presented to you guys last year at Pistola, um, who uh, is a 15-year-old female with classic PTC diagnosed in 2016 with a 1.9 centimeter primary tumor, 23 out of 49 lymph nodes involved and extensive pulmonary metastasis a diagnosis. Over the next three and a half or so years of treatment, um, she received surgery and a total of 600 millicuries of radioiodine. And even after this therapy, her thyroid globulin was still greater than 7,000 nanograms per ml. Uh, and she had progressive... Uh, uh, lung disease on her CT scan. So she was started on the multi-kinase inhibitor lenvatinib in 2020. And as you can see here, she had a dramatic improvement in her pulmonary nodule count and size 
uh, after only four months of therapy on lenvatinib. And her thyroid globulin decreased from 7,000 to 90 nanograms per mil, again, after only four months of therapy. But despite her dramatic improvement, she had some really serious side effects, including diarrhea with um, incontinence, fatigue, and nausea, decreased appetite and weight loss, and painful hand foot syndrome that made it even hard for her to walk. Um, it's called palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia, and it's seen in up to 50% of patients treated with lenvatinib in, in trials. Uh, um, and this is because of the inhibition of the VEGF receptor in the endothelial cells. So because of this, her dose was quickly decreased over the next several months, um, but her side effects really continued to affect her life uh, in, a, in a serious way. So what if we could know which part of the pathway was mutated in her cancer and even in her metastases? Uh, the goal of which would be to have a targeted therapy that wouldn't have all of these side effects for her. Um, so we know that up to 95% of pediatric heart cancer has identifiable mutations um, and that there are some promising drugs available to target these. An example of one of these common driver mutations is the RET fusion. Um, these are common in pediatric PT uh, uh, and differentiated th carcinomas. And uh, what happens when you have RET combined, the RET proto-oncogene combined with one of several fusion partners is loss of ligand dependent signaling. And this results in constitutive kinase activity and eventually uncontrolled proliferation and oncogenesis. In pediatric DTC, um, there are about half estimates uh, with fusions identified around 20% with the BRFB600E mutation and maybe up to a quarter without identifiable mutation. Among the fusions, the RET fusions are about half again and the NTRAC3 and 1 fusions are about a third and ALK fusions in about 11% or so. Furthermore, the fusions are enriched in age groups 10 and the age group of 10 and younger pediatric cases, and they're more advanced disease at presentation with more commonly persistent disease than that found in patients with point mutations. There's lower expression of thyroid differentiation genes than when a, a, an adult patient has a fusion. And a really important example of this is the sodium ion symporter, which is crucial for iodine uptake and concentration in the regular normal thyroid cell, but crucial for uptake of radioiodine in the cancer cell. The BRFE600E point mutation, which usually portends a much more aggressive disease course in adult thyroid cancer patients, has a better prognosis than fusions do in children. And the highest representation uh, BRFE600E point mutations is in the older pediatric group of 15 to 19 years. There's also a better prognosis with this point mutation for children than when a child has a fusion mutated cancer. Um, and this just shows how uh, as age progresses, um, the percent fusions decreases and overall scape of mutations deriving the tumor is different. So the group on the left is the less than 10 year olds showing the vast majority of fusions uh, in red. And then as you go to the right, the 10 to 14 year olds have fewer fusions and the 15, 19 year olds have even fewer fusions with more representation of point mutations in that group. Evaluation of mRNA expression of various thyroid differentiation genes has become really important in determining what is the transcriptome landscape in the tumor. And so you can see here the uh, genes listed vertically on the left side and uh, blue means they're less expressed and um, that's on a spectrum to orange, which means they're more expressed and the cells evaluated. On the right side are normal cells, normal thyroid cells. And so these are expressing um, the top several genes in a strong manner. And so you see that in orange as compared to um, the more blue on left side, especially in those top six genes. Differential expression in adult differentiated thyroid carcinoma has led to the development of classification into two major phenotypes, a BRAF-like or more aggressive phenotype shown at the top in, a, in blue 
and a RAS-like or less aggressive phenotype down at the top in red. So it's a spectrum across the top there. And the very first uh, line is called the TDS, the thyroid differentiation score. And this is composed of um, different profiles of mRNA expression of the genes shown again in the bottom. This is kind of a similar layout to the last slide uh, with green being less expressed and red being more expressed. Uh, but interestingly, we, there's also use of microRNA uh, shown at the bottom in blue and yellow to further enrich these profiles and give more information about uh, tumor mutation and subsequent behavior. But if we look closer on the left here um, at fusion profiles, we can see that uh, the, the furthest left with the uh, red and yellow at the top, those are the pediatric cases of fusions. And the ones with the blue at the top are the um, adult fusion cases. And you can just even visually see here that there's a distinct difference between the expression profiles of these, these top six genes in particular, most of which have to do with iodine uptake and concentration. And specifically, um, the third one listed there is SLC5A5, which encodes the sodium iodine synthetic. So it's really hard to say uh, how applicable the profiles are gonna be uh, in predicting disease in um, childhood fusions. And so you can see up at the, at the top right here, um, a kind of a model for describing the two different major phenotypes of adult thyroid cancer, which is the BRAF-like or more aggressive phenotype and the RAS-like or less aggressive phenotype. And here, these are, are shown with ERK score and TDS. So the ERK score is a composite score of how active the kinase pathway is, and that is associated with more invasive behavior. And the TDS is the thyroid differentiation score, uh, which has to do with mRNA expression profiling. But because fusions confer more aggressive disease and represent a larger proportion of thyroid cancer in children, it makes sense to consider a third phenotype, um, which would be a fusion-like cancer phenotype being the most aggressive, higher ERK score, lower thyroid differentiation score, and overall more invasive behavior. So what do we have so far to um, evaluate these tumors? And there's some really robust, um, several different the Affirma Expression Atlas. And um, you can see listed here from their website, 593 genes analyzed with 905 var variants, 235 fusions, um, giving robust information on what is being expressed by your patient's FNA sample or tumor sample. And they also uh, give an expression signature, which um, is basically categorizing that patient's tumor into BRF-like, RAS-like, or neither categories. Similarly, the thyroseq gene classifier also has many genes, variants, fusions, and alterations uh, that can describe your patient's cancer. But applicability to childhood differentiated thyroid carcinoma is limited. So what do we use these tests for? Oh, well, Dr. French just mentioned a really big uh, part of the FNA, uh, things that are confusing, which is with the cyprian four samples or indeterminate nodules. Um, and these confer as low as a 5% risk of cancer in adults, but as high as a 60% risk of cancer in children. Um, so what to these is maybe a difficult determination sometimes. And so that's a good use for this test. Also, uh, the, the suspicious and malignant uh, FNA samples with the threads of five and sixes can also be sent to help predict tumor behavior and maybe identify which tumors will likely need molecular targeted therapy. And you can also send metastatic samples for this testing. And we've known for a while that we need some kind of new therapy. Um, surgery and radii have been the cornerstone of therapy for a long time, and they're very effective in most cases of differentiated thyroid carcinoma in children and adults. Uh, but over time, we've seen long-term effects of radioiodine, and we also know that they're not always curative. And there's a growing population of patients with stable persistent lung disease, um, and even gradually increasing disease that we have options for. And as we saw in our patient, Multi-kinase inhibitors uh, may work really well, but may not be tolerated for very long. And so now I'm gonna discuss um, some drugs that are in trials. And so far, 
um, I'll, I'll tell you which ones are approved in what ages. Um, so first is silver catenib, which is a selective RET inhibitor. And um, this uh, RET is mutated uh, in the germline in patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma. So on the left, we see MTC patients with germline RET mutations. And all of these patients um, were treated previously with multi-kinase inhibitors. And we can see that even so, uh, the tumor response is, is really impressive with an overall uh, reduction rate of 59% and some 100% responders even in this previously treated group. And on the right side, we have RET fusion positive thyroid cancers, also previously treated or resistant to therapies. Um, with an overall response rate of 79% and some 100% responders. And this group did include, include some pediatric patients. Also, uh, we have prosetinib, which is a RET inhibitor. And both prosetinib and sulfurcatinib are FDA approved for 12 years and up with radioiodine refractory disease and an identified RET mutation. And there are some uh, promising results for this drug as well from the ERA trial. Um, however, these patients were all over 18, but there were some RET fusion thyroid carcinomas included in this trial. Larotrectinib is a TREC inhibitor that is uh, not approved for use in children, uh, but it's shown good response in thyroid cancer with pooled adult and pediatric data, including thyroid cancer with brain metastases and some 100% responders in children. So back to our patient um, who had really wonderful response in her CT scan from lymphatinib that had some really terrible uh, side effects that were causing her to be really depressed and, and affecting her quality of life. She had oncogene testing on a bronchoscopy specimen uh, about two years into therapy. And however, there was not a targetable mutation identified. And so Two years later, which is four years total into her therapy, we really wanted something else for her. And we were looking at possibly um, using some targeted therapy. So we sent her same sample again, two years later, and an NTREC3 fusion was identified. So we were able to switch her from lenvatinib to larotrectinib, which is a, a targeted TREC um, drug. And she's had incredible reduction in her side effects. Um, with targeted therapy, as well as a stable CT scan and her thyroid globulin remains under 100. A couple of comments on the sodium iodine symporter and uptake of radio iodine. Um, another potential effect of targeted thyroid kinase inhibition is restoring the uptake of radio iodine in these cells. So when the MAPK pathway is hyperactivated, um, there's potential for dilation of the sodium iodine center to a degree that would render radio iodine therapy not helpful. But it's been reported in several adult patients and also some pediatric patients that um, the use of fusion targeted therapy can restore radio iodine um, uptake. And so in two patients uh, described by Lee et al., uh, both pediatric patients, one with an NTREC1 fusion and the other with a RET fusion, were both treated with fusion-targeted therapy, namely larotrectinib and sulfurcatinib, and both had reduction in tumor size with restoration of iodine uptake. So to summarize some of the important driver mutation we've, we've talked about, uh, about 75% of pediatric BTC will have a, a mutation that we can identify with current platforms. And there's a mysterious 25% or so that um, may identify soon <laughs> as these are being developed. And um, maybe up to half, a quarter or a half, will have a point mutation, mostly BRAF B600E, but also the DICER1 and TERT mutations. And up to half will have fusions identified. Most of these will be RET, but also important are INTREC1 and 3 and OUT fusions. And a small number have been found to have an amplification of a growth factor receptor drug in the pathway. So when to use these tests is still um, up for grabs in pediatric cases, but it's really important to send uh, indeterminate samples. So Bethesda three and fours on FNA for molecular profiling. And of course, if they're suspicious, um, even on the adult platforms, you're gonna, you're gonna get a readout of um, what they found in the molecular analysis. Um, 
But with the suspicious ones, uh, you'll send them for usual treatment with um, total thyroidectomy, possibly lobectomy, and then possibly radioiodine as well. But I wanted to point out that even when one of these profiles um, labels your patient as having a benign mutational analysis, um, you have to also just be really careful to make sure there's no suspicious ultrasound findings, especially microcalcifications, uh, despite that benign reading. Um, these patients still may need lobectomy or even total thyroidectomy and possibly radioiodine, depending. And there's further application for metastases. Um, you can send those samples as well um, for molecular analysis. And then even in your patients with as a five or six, um, suspicious or clearly malignant pathology, um, there's a role for this as well in uh, management, managing your patients. And as summarize uh, some of the medicines that are being uh, evaluated. The BREF v 600 e point mutation can be treated uh, with dibrafenib or venurafenib in adults. And it's important to note that this is only to be used in combination with a MEK inhibitor. Uh, MEK inhibitors include trametinib and selumetinib. Again, none of these that I mentioned so far are for use in children. Um, fusions, so the RET fusion can be treated with sulpercatinib or calcetinib, and I noted earlier that these are both approved for use in children uh, with refractory thyroidoma over 12 years of age and including 12 years. And the NTREC1 and 3 fusions can be treated with larotrectinib and entrectinib. These are not approved for use in children yet. Uh, ALK fusions uh, are addressed with crizotinib and serotinib, and actually crizotinib not labeled for use for thyroid cancer, but it is labeled uh, for ALK positive anaplastic large cell lymphoma in children that are one year of age and older. And certain of is used in adults. And then if you're not able to identify a, a driver mutation, you can use a multi kinase inhibitor like we did in our patient um, off label, linvatinib and serafinib. Oh, and I'm so sorry, I forgot to mention that entrectinib for intract fusions is approved for use as well in children 12 years and older with refractory thyroid cancer. So in conclusion, we have some effective new potential therapies for pediatric DTC, an increasing understanding of the molecular landscape and tumor behavior of DTC in kids. Um, with limited sample sizes, the ones I showed you were uh, from uh, one with an N of 96 and one with an N of 103. Um, and the adult, adult sample size is much larger. Um, but we do have a really good increasing understanding of the molecular landscape, especially with the addition of microRNA. And existing tools like the Affirmant ThyroSeq that I showed are useful in children, um, but they're developed for adult differentiated thyroid carcinoma, so applicability is limited. And our remaining questions are, when should molecular profiling be done? How do we interpret our results um, in pediatric patients? And when should we consider using um, either targeted or multi-tyrosine kinase inhibition in our thyroid cancer patients? And we look forward to those new guidelines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis and Dr. Kerr. Um, we have one minute for questions. Is there anyone from the floor um, who has a uh, pressing question? There are two questions. The first question is, how often should we do um, thyroid ultrasound in siblings of patients with DTC? And should it be yearly, or what is the current, what would you recommend? Dr. Francis. Good question, who is not currently in the guideline, a stipulation as to how frequently that should be repeated. It just says that it should be done during childhood. So um, probably every five years, if there's nothing seen on the first one, would be my usual practice, but that's not yet stipulated in the guideline. Another question, given the approximate 25% risk for malignancy for AUS, um, FLUS, can you discuss added benefit of performing molecular testing, which requires another biopsy? 
Yes, um, it, it is much higher in children, the risk for malignancy in these indeterminate thyroid nodules. Um, so the benefit for now is um, really if, if you are brave enough to use one of these off-label therapies and you discover something um, that can be targeted like a RET mutation or um, a TREC fusion, um, then that could be a consideration. Um, but really you're looking at deciding how your patient's doing. Um, and so a lot of these patients do well for a long time with um, stable CTs and a stable thyroid globulin level. So it really depends on how your patient is doing. Um, and we'll see in, in the future years um, how that all shakes out as far as um, therapy and when we should be considering starting therapy in relation to the head. So just to add one thing, um, you can work with these companies to various protocols. What we do at our institution is every child who goes for FNA has a sample collected for molecular analysis. So it does not require a second biopsy. Those are not sent unless the report comes back that does the three or four. So we hold them in pathology and we have permission from the company to do that, even though it wastes some of the reagents, but they're very happy to do that. So talk to some of these um, corporations and you may be able to work out some protocols that don't require psychopaths. Um, do we have to get IRB approval? No, these are clinical tests. This is not a research study. What about insurance covering for those types of things? Uh, the company that we're working with uh, uh, has um, funding available for those who have no insurance at all, which is a big a part of our population in San Antonio. Um, and if most of the insurance companies do cover this for Bethesda 3-4, it is an indicated, uh, uh, an indicated test. 